there's them cells below the ground where we had no bedding, just a wooden board, one blanket and um, very little to eat. They're quite cruel um, um, to us. After the two weeks um, we were to get the stick, we were uh, badly marked and I decided to, uh, never to do anything wrong again. I was absolutely cured. The French are funny, they kiss each other with both cheeks. It happened to me outside the French Embassy, it was very embarrassing. I was tying my shoelaces at the time. <laughs> I blew him one back. <laughs> Have you seen a new German flag? It's a deck chair with a towel over it. <laughs> All the jokes used to be about the Germans. During the war, this little Irish private went up to his commanding officer. Sir, I'd like a weekend pass. He said, not during the war unless you do something brave. He said, what do you consider brave? He said, capture a German tank. He was back in five minutes or one. Five weekend passes, they brought all the generals down to meet him. How do you do it, Pat? He said, it's easy, sir. I drive up to the front, I shout, Fritz, do you want a weekend pass? He said, yes, we swap tanks. <laughs> when I was 17, that was a very good year. Well, it was. I just got out of the reform school and uh, I was hoping to go straight back into show business and make a name for myself, but my grandfather, and my Uncle Tim had uh, different ideas. They wanted me to get a proper job. And here's where they brought me to the famous Harlem Wolf shipyard here in Belfast. A catch boy wasn't much of a job, but it was a start, four pound a week. And uh, you work with a team of four people. And a catch boy catches a boat like this. Most of them are about that size for the shell. And we, McKee, Mr. McKee that I worked for, he was a shell riveter, what do you call a shell riveter? That was a, a prized job, to be a, a shell riveter. And Apple Sammy was his uh, holder on. So the rivet, I would put the rivet into the hole like that. And Sammy would put his hammer to it like that. And McKee would be on the other side, going round and round. And the noise and the, 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 the urgency to get it into the, the hole and to, to pair it off. And, Sammy would be there shaking like mad all day long. The hardest job I've ever seen in all my life. I know coal miners working three or four feet on their bellies all the time. Well, Sammy worked always on his belly, always holding on with his head with anything. And when he came out of the shipyard, he shook. He shook. And when he got his first pint, he shook. You know, and I thought, that's, that's a job I'd never want to do, ever, ever. I was a catch boy on the Canberra. The Canberra wasn't known as the Canberra then, it was known as 1621, that was the number of the boat, 1621. Little did I know that from being a lowly catch boy, through the programme Catch Phrase, Ray! I'd get to be quite famous and go on tour around the world on the famous Canberra. Uh, and I was dead proud to tell everybody that I had uh, Worked on it 15, I think it was 15 world cruises I did on the Canberra. Just say what you see. Land, kitchen sink. Right! And I'm very pleased to tell anybody that was in the shipyard at that time that the Canberra was so well made by the riveters that it's now in North Pakistan and they can't get it apart. <laughs> they tried to break it up and they can't do it. It was so well made. Just say what you see. All hands on deck. Right! Yeah. Especially my part, someone told me, you know, just on the left-hand side, we put along the keel. <laughs> There's going to be some big movies made here next year. Do you remember The Silence of the Lambs? Yeah. Remember? Yeah. They're making the Belfast version next year. It's called Shut Up Yous. <laughs> when I was 18, um, I went off to uh, England for a while. Um, James Young, I'd been working with him, and Jimmy had said to me, look, you've done UTV and whatever, get yourself over and give yourself a chance in England. So off I went to join the George Mitchell Singers or something like that. Just a dream that I had about getting into show business across the water. It didn't work out. I nearly starved to death. After about six months, my funds had all run down, so I found myself being called up in the army. I was glad to get into it. I didn't want to come home as a failure, so off I went. Eight years later, I came back to Northern Ireland. So I came to work here at this post office as a country postman. And every morning at five o'clock, we used to uh, make our way round this four or five postmen, round this little entry. All the bikes would be lined up. 
and there's a door here so we went in there and sorted out all our letters and uh, I didn't have many to do because I was a country postman so I just come out with my little bag tied on the back there and uh, got on the bicycle and headed off into the country. Four and a half hours of doing this on this bone shaker. Eh? I couldn't be bothered with that there, so every day I used to bring the bike down here and just leave it here. Take the bag and my half a dozen of letters or whatever it was. And with all the money I'd saved up whenever I was away in the army doing national service and then signing on, traveling all around the world, being an active service in Borneo, saved all my pennies and bought myself this. Now is this style or what? I was the most stylish postman in the whole country. And what's more, I could do the run now in 40 minutes. That old prostrate problem. I overheard two fellas talking in the pub, one had a stutter. He said to his friend, what's that prostrate problem you have? He said, it's simple. I pee the way you talk. <laughs> Boy, it's 40 years since I did this. This is a 16 pound um, throwing hammer, the same one as they use in the, in the Olympics. That's over a stone in weight. That's quite a lot of potatoes. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, I took up this sport in the late 50s when I was in the army. Little did I know I'd become the Northern Ireland hammer throwing champion. Now, a lot of people said I was going to be an Olympic champion. I don't think I'd ever have made the weight. But I had so much fun out of doing it, and uh, I'm going to show you if I can still throw it or not. <laughs> so, even if you're sitting at home, you're not safe. Are you ready for this? never leaves you, you know. <laughs> My father had bad blood pressure. He didn't want to get excited. <coughs> he didn't want to waken up the neighbors. So he had a brilliant idea, as fathers do. He used to hit us on the head with a slipper. <laughs> Every word he spoke, he struck. It went like this. How many times have I told you to be in this house at 11 o'clock at night. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> the blood pressure took over. He forgot who he was. <laughs> Do you know who I am? <laughs> then he forgot who I was. <laughs> who do you think you are? You'd never believe in a million years where I'm standing at the moment that this car park used to be the social center of Belfast nightlife. And this particular car park here, this is where the first nightclub really was in Belfast, the talk of the time. First of all, it was a little place called the Trocadero, which was about a hundred seater. But here was a 400 seater, which was owned and run by the Sharp Brothers. Well, Nori had this great idea to put a 60-foot sign on top of the building. It was a one-story building. And it went, the talk of the town, Roy Walker welcomes you to the talk of the town, and this week's star would be underneath. People to this day, that's donkeys years ago, they will still say, Roy, talk of the town, remember? And if, I'll never go a day without someone saying that to me here in Belfast. When your mother got angry, she became a ventriloquist. <laughs> Get in the house. <laughs> Get up the stairs! When the talk of the town opened, um, I actually bought a house, which is very unusual in them days for anyone to, uh, to buy a house. Most people just rented a house, and I came here to this uh, street with my wife and three children, Rochester Street, and um, it's a very happy wee street in those days, lovely neighbours. I'm sure it is today as well, but 
Little did we know what was in front of us. I, uh, I was working three jobs a day. I was in the talk of the town from seven o'clock till about 11 at night. Five o'clock in the morning I'd be at the market because I opened up a little fruit shop which my wife helped run with me. And um, during the day I drove a van for a butcher's. A great guy called Frank gave me a job. And I used the van sometimes, don't be telling anybody, to get some of the fruit from the market and bring it to the shop because I couldn't afford a van. And all of a sudden, in 69, the trouble started. Well, it was a wee bit naive with me being in a, in a, in a mixed marriage situation. It wasn't the place to be over in East Belfast. And I could understand, I suppose I couldn't have went to West Belfast either. The business just dropped off completely. I finished up giving it away for nothing. And the house was attacked as well as the shop was attacked. I haven't seen this house since 1969. I left here in 1969. I bought a car, I was skint. I bought a car for 45 quid. Put all my belongings in it and went for the boat as fast as I could. But then there was an awful lot of people in Belfast that suffered a lot more. I was very, very lucky. I got a good chance after seven years over in Sunderland. I got on the TV programme, New Faces. Thank you very much indeed. Well, I've had a marvellous week. <laughs> On Sunday, I watched James Hunt win the World Championship in Japan. My brother, Shuey, he was in that race. He nearly won it. Only he made 25 pit stops. <laughs> One for petrol and 24 for directions. <laughs> I think people are, you know, your success is their success, I think. Uh, they all know where I come from. And uh, I don't forget where I came from. Hello, uh, somebody once said, it's not where you come from, it's where you're going. I'm good, just so uh, I'm always glad to come back. But you're looking well. I'm at the school year now. That's really, really, really yes. Yeah, my auntie I'm May. And I'm going to let down there. That's right. He was telling me about this funny job he had. He's not allowed to speak on it. It's all whispering and hand signals. Twelve o'clock come, he said to the lads, Lads, what time's the lunch break? One of them said, half twelve to one. Oh, he said, I only got married on Saturday. I was hoping to nip home for an hour. He said, go ahead, we'll cover up for you. He nipped home and caught the big foreman in bed with his wife. We got back to work the next morning. Twelve o'clock, the lad said, Shuey, are you going home for an hour? He said, no, I nearly got caught yesterday. You like to be up and about when you're on holidays. So after dinner, I went to reception. I left an early call in for next morning. Sure enough, knock on the bedroom door, a lovely little Irish porter. Good morning, sir. Was it six o'clock or seven o'clock you want to call out? <laughs> I said, actually, it was eight o'clock. <laughs> what time is it now? He said, a quarter past 11. <laughs> That's just Roy Walker. I know. The Queen of Asides coming up next on BBC One as Ruby Wax meets Hugh Hefner.